All right, we'll read verse 8. And the four beasts, we know, had each of them six wings about him. We know that. And they were full of eyes within. We know that. Look at this. And they rest not day and night, so they don't sleep. Saying what? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Notice three times holy. God's name, three times, Lord God Almighty. Notice the time. Past, which was, is present, and is to come. Future, three times, three times, three times, three times. Why? Because God is a three times person. He makes up of that. He is the Trinity right here. That's why. Holy, 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 one to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Notice that it covers all timelines. It also covers his title, Lord God Almighty. And when those beasts give glory, so God deserves glory, he deserves fame and honor. So God deserves the respect. You got to respect his majesty. You got to give him honor and thanks. Notice that God deserves your gratitude to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. You'll notice right here, why does he deserve glory, honor, and even your thanks? Just because... Listen up now. This is something you need to get in your heads. Just because of who he is. Just because he is God. That alone should suffice the reason why he deserves your glory, your honor, and your thanks to him. Not because he died for you. Not because he blessed you. Not because he answered your prayers. But just because of who he is. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There's a song that goes, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. It's all the reason that I need to voice my praise because of who you are. That's because of who he is. All right, so let's look at verse 10. Uh, before I continue, I just want to give a little sermonette. So when's the last time that you prayed to the Lord thanking him for who he is? When's the last time? Thank you for the food. It shows how fleshy you are, see? Because yeah. your flesh is satisfied with it. Yeah. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for uh, my wife and husband. Great thing. But see, it's a fleshy thing. Why? Because it's a fleshy relationship and connection. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much for uh, answering my prayer we, where you have more people in this church. Well, that's a spiritual fruit. You're getting closer. You're getting warmer, but it's not hot. You got to worship him because of who he is. Oh, this pain that I'm going through, but you still deserve the thanks, Lord, just because of who you are. Lord, you still deserve praise even when you cast your judgment at the great white throne and then cast your judgment about this person burning in hell for eternity and this person going to heaven for all eternity. You still deserve the praise, glory, and honor Amen. and thanks. Why? Because of who he is you got to realize this, God don't just throw people in hell on a whim, like a Calvinist. Elect, non-elect, elect, elect, non-elect, elect, non-elect. I don't like Sean, non-elect. Robert, he's too loud, non-elect right here. All right, Gene, I don't like him, but I'll keep him. All right, elect, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so God, amen. Remember, God doesn't do that on a whim. He does it for a holy, right, perfect, very good reason for doing so. Everything he does is for a perfect, holy, just, fair, right reason for doing so, which is why he should deserve the thanks for it, the glory and honor for it. That's a sermonette. That will hit hard. And you know what's really sad is that because Calvinists, they take so much by faith of who he is that even if he does this on a whim, they get away about, you know, about people falling into suffering and sin and going to hell. Calvinists say it's all because of God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty. That's how they get away with it. And they make God an evil God. But let's also be honest too. They take his sovereignty of who he is more seriously than you Christians. Because when you go through hard times and problems, you just cry and whine to God. Calvinists, they just think, well, that's just how God who he is, so I just have to accept him for who he is. I don't preach. I don't preach. People think that I'm so hard on Calvinists and unfair. No. 
I give credit to whom credit is due. Calvinist, this is sad, but some Calvinists online can make better preachers and take God's holiness more seriously than some of you Bible-believing, dispensational, King James-only Christians. All right, let's go back to our Revelation 4. Now that I preach my sermonette on you, let's move on. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne. So now they're bowing down before him. Whoever these twenty-four elders are, they're bowing down before him. And you'll notice as well, as you keep reading the passage, and worship him that liveth forever and ever. God lives forever. He doesn't die. He deserves your worship. And look at this, cast their crowns before the throne. See, they're casting their crowns before him. Who's the one that gets the crowns? If you read Revelation 2 and 3, the Christians in the church. See that? This is not tribulation saints either, because how do you know that, Pastor? Because we didn't even start the tribulation yet. Look at that. So if you're a hyper-dispensationalist, saying Revelation 2 and 3 is only tribulation application, you got a problem here. Because then you can't identify who these people are with their crowns except Revelation 2 and 3. And God was speaking to the church. And you can't say those are only tribulation saints. Why? Because the tribulation didn't even start yet. So you have to put, if you're a hyper-dispensationalist, you better think seriously and realize that, hey man, it seems like that there's a Christian application here at Revelation 2 and 3. What did I tell you before all the time? Revelation 2 and 3, double application, double application, double application. A non-dispensationalist will think, well, this is only Christian at Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, you're wrong. Hyper-dispensationalists will say, this is only tribulation, say, Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, you're wrong. A right Bible-believing dispensationalist will say this is a double application. Right. Now, I'm not going to explain how that makes sense or why. I did it so many times in my other Revelation studies. You watch that one. All right, I gave you so many verses. I dedicated a big chunk of video on double application, which was very interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was also very convincing. You have to put it, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, you try doing one application. And I guarantee you this, you have to manipulate and twist verses. Yeah. All right, now let's look at Revelation 4. So they cast their crowns before the throne, saying what? Thou art worthy, O Lord. Yes, he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Yes, God deserves glory, he deserves your honor, and he deserves power for it. Why? For thou hast created all things. See, because God created everything. That's why he deserves the glory, honor, and power. Because he's God. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. So currently, the creation of today and what God created before at the beginning, Genesis 1, because of that, he deserves your worship. Well, what? I don't believe that I should worship God. Who are you to say that to one who gave you the air to breathe? See? Atheists will never understand that. They have to put God at a humane level like me and you. Fair, fair. We got to treat each other fairly. That's why they think God is unfair. You know why? They, put, they make God a human. That's limiting God. God cannot be God if he has to be a human like you. God, what does God mean? He's elevated higher above humans, which means he deserved your worship, he deserved your praise, and it doesn't matter if he doesn't play fair with you or he plays fair with you. It doesn't matter. He's higher than you. He deserves that respect and glory and honor and power, period. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 5. All right, I don't think I can finish all of this chapter, but uh, let's cover this part. <laughs> let's cover this one. All right, this is going to be fun. Verse 1, and I saw in the right hand of him, ah, here we go, the right hand of him that sat on the throne, okay, so remember God's sitting on this throne, but on his right hand he's holding something, a book written within, there's a book that has writing inside and on the back side, it's on, so on the back side, sealed with seven seals, what in the world, whatever this book is, Wherever I'm going to put this book, um, 
Oh well, I hate to do this. Okay. So whatever is holding, he's holding in his right hand over here. So I know technically this is his right hand, but let's just put this as his right hand, okay? In his right hand over here, he's holding a book. In this book that he's holding in his right hand over here, it is sealed with seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven right here, okay? So he's holding seven seals over here. Now within these seven seals that he's holding over here, you're going to notice that it is written within and also on the back side. Okay, whatever that means. What is this book? Whatever it does, it looks like a Bible. <laughs> All right, let's cover this one by one. First of all, it must be understood that it is sealed. That's the key. The key is sealing. So whatever this book is, it's referring to seals. Now, another thing is this. If you study then the seals, what is the seals covering? Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... So Jesus opens the seal, and what? Notice verse 2, the Antichrist comes out. Verse 4, the second seal is open. The red horse comes out. Notice at verse 5, the third uh, seal is broken. The black horse comes out. Uh, you'll notice the fourth seal is broken at verse 7, and that's death and hell. Verse 9, you'll see the fifth and sixth seals opening up, referring to the tribulation saints being martyred and then chaos in the heavens. And then you'll notice that the seventh seal, that God's going to unleash it uh, as we read it later on, which we won't do it for now, which is chapter 8, verse 1. And it shows that time is no longer. God's about to wrap everything up. But, wait a minute. These seals are referring to the entire end times then right here. The tribulation. Huh. Now, look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. And I want you to go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. The sealing of this book then is referring to Revelation itself. Notice that Daniel, when he was giving parts of Revelation, the end times of Revelation, what did God tell Daniel? Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. There is no doubt the book of Daniel consists of the same things as Revelation, right? Okay, what did God tell Daniel to do at Daniel chapter 12, verse 4? But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to when? Time of the end. Look at verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the what? Time of the end. Revelation 22, verse 10. There is no doubt this sealing of the book is referring to the end times, the tribulation. Revelation 22, verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this what? For the what? Time. Revelation. Boom. Aren't you glad we stuck around a little longer over here, man? So we notice right here that the, that's why it makes sense. Why did God tell Daniel to shut it up? It wasn't time yet. You need someone worthy to open it. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. Oh, I got to introduce his majesty right here. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? 
So there's even a strong angel who couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, Somebody had to be stronger than this angel to open this book. Yeah. Daniel had to seal it. Somebody worthy had to unleash it. Verse 3, and no man in heaven, so no one in heaven, nor on earth, no one in earth, neither under the earth, not even the powers of hell, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Not, not, let alone open it, they can't even look at the book. There's only one worthy to do this. Verse 4, and I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So John was weeping because how can Jesus Christ come down as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? And you get that happy ending, see? Yeah. That happy ending is necessary where we all live happily ever after. We cannot get that until he unleashes that. So now we're weeping. He can't open it. And if he didn't open this, you know what would happen? We would be like what all the atheists, the communists, and all the world leaders, the Catholics, and all the world religions are trying to do. We can build our heaven here on earth, you know. Global warming is real, and the planet is going to be destroyed, but we can do it. We can build our kingdom here on earth. You know what I would be? I would be like John weeping. I'd shoot my brains out and say, no, I can't do it. This, this is not my ending right here. See, if Jesus Christ didn't, Lucy Seal, do you realize what kind of earth we'd still be in today? Sin struck, death killed, corrupted earth. I need that lamb to open it. Bring me that happy ending. Look at verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, so one of the 24 elders, one of the representatives speaking to John, weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. That's important. Notice that the, one of the 24 elders says to John, don't weep. Why? Because Jesus, he's known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Because he's from the root of David, Israel. But notice why he can open it. It says, hath prevailed. Amen. That means there had to be something significant that this lamb had to do so that he can open this book. What did he have to do? We're going to close it here. Look at verse 9. There's your answer. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? 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 For, this is not, notice, that's why Muhammad does not qualify as God. Buddha does not qualify as God. Joseph Smith does not qualify as your founder. Charles Russell cannot qualify. Mary Baker Eddy, Ellen G. White, no one can qualify. Because they didn't do this. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Amen. Through his sacrifice, look at verse 10, and hast made us unto our gods kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. There are two significant events you got to keep in mind why this is important. That's why, why did God have to come twice if it wasn't that important? There are two comings that have to happen. Otherwise, we would not be here and live happily ever after. There have to be two comings. His first coming was his death on the cross. If he did not pay the sin debt on the cross, he would not have been worthy to open that book. You got to realize this. If he gave up on the cross, we would not live happily ever after. Here's another thing. If Jesus Christ won't open the seals and unleash the tribulation where he can come down the second time, we cannot live happily ever after. This will be doomed as a sin-corrupted, death-stricken planet underneath the feet of the elites, underneath the king of hell itself, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them. So Jesus Christ had to come twice. He had to die for us so that he can unleash the seal and then take back his kingdom and we can all live happily ever after. That's why he was worthy to open it. And that's why this is important. Why is this important? Why is this important? You wouldn't get your happy ending. 
That's why this is important.